Hello, everyone. Bonjour, tout le monde. And thank you for joining the Deloitte AI Institute Canada for today's panel discussion on generative AI. My name is Audrey, Audrey Anson, and I'm the Deloitte AI Institute Canada leader. Before we begin, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. We do acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of the lands we are on today. Deloitte Canada has offices with representation across most of the country. We acknowledge that our offices reside on traditional treaty and unceded territories as part of Turtle Island, which is still home to many First Nations, Metis and Inuit people. Lastly, please note that this webcast will be recorded and made available on the Deloitte AI Institute webpage. You will be able to see this video in the language of your preference. Recently, generative AI has, has been overwhelming our global media and news outlet. At Deloitte, we believe that AI without context is meaningless. And as such, we wanted to make sure that we discuss generative AI in the context of different industries. Today, we will start with financial services industry. And we have brought a team of client, ecosystem, and Deloitte players that can help us reflect on both the, um, on the implications of generative AI for, for FSI. In this webcast, we'll focus on defining, contextualizing, and talking about the considerations for Gen AI as it relates to signature issues for financial services industry, such as the need to personalize content for customer, the need to augment our, our workforce, and for example, the, the need to optimize and reimagine both middle, middle and back office processes. Spending the next hour with us, we have Heathcliff, Priyanka, Camille, Anand, and Shabazz, which I'm going to introduce to you in a second. Let's start with Heathcliff. Heathcliff Lewis is a product manager of AI technologies. Since 2021, he, he, he is he has been building and is deploying conversational AI system at scale. And this is before chat GPT, so pre-chat GPT. He champions the use of natural language interfaces to enable superior user experiences, workflow automation, and to generate efficiencies using artificial intelligence. He brings over 12 years of technology management consulting and product management experience and is passionate about democratizing access to AI inside world-class organizations. Heathcliff, huge welcome. Thank you, Audrey. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Next, we have Priyanka, Priyanka Vergadia. She is staff developer advocate at Google, and you might recognize her from the Google Cloud Tech YouTube channel. She builds highly engaging and uniquely visual uniquely visual content for developers and technical practitioners. She has created more than 500 pieces of content across videos, blogs, and tutorials. Talk about generating content, eh? She is one of the top visual storytellers with over 100,000 followers across social media platform. She marries her artist skills with the technical expertise to create sketches for folks to learn from. She is an author, who has combined her technical knowledge with visual storytelling into her recently published number one best-selling book, Visualizing Google Cloud. You can also find her video on cloud concepts on her YouTube channel, The Cloud Girl, and her website, thecloudgirl.dev. Priyanka, a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much. I'm excited to have this conversation. Fantastic. Um, our next panelist is Camille, Camille Garcia Bicot. Camille is a seasoned product manager leader with over 15 years of experience in the financial industry. Uh, currently working for Desjardins, Canada's largest cooperative financial institution, she has a track record of delivering successful product that have helped her organization innovate, always with her users' interests and needs at the core of her practices. Camille's journey in the financial industry started while studying at HSC Montréal in organizational leadership. She quickly rose through the ranks to become a product manager, where she gained extensive experience in leading multidisciplinary teams, creating sound business strategies and bringing teams together 
to ship value efficiently through stimulating product vision and tailor-made user experience. During her time as a product manager, she spearheaded various projects from web app for credit cards to transforming interactive voice responses with AI, for which her team won an Octus Award recognizing excellence in technology in Quebec, also known as the Technology Oscars, I was told, those Octus Awards. So Camille, for that award, but also uh, your, your experience, a huge congratulations, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Audrey. Um, we are joined today also by Anand, Anand Nimkar. Anand leads our conversational AI and generative AI services and partnerships in Canada. He is focused on technology delivery and strategy of natural language processing, NLP solutions in customer and employee servicing processes. He has led engineering teams on AI platform, cloud and digital transformation programs at large financial institutions in Canada. And his primary sectors are retail banking and insurance with some cross industry experience in public sector and consumer retail. Anand, knowing how busy you are with Jenny ID these days, I am so thankful and grateful for your, for your time on this webcast today. Thank you, Audrey, for having me. And last but not least, our facilitator today is Shabazz, Shabazz Badesha. Shabazz is a senior manager in Deloitte's Omnia AI strategy practice and a leader in our FSI, um, in our financial services data and AI offerings. He brings over 15 years of experience advising CIOs, CDOs of global clients in banking and in insurance industries, and has led multiple large-scale data and analytics transformation program for strategic cap capability development, regulatory compliance, and M&A integrations. Shabazz, thank you very much for accepting to facilitate the conversation today. Over to you. It is my pleasure, Audrey. Welcome, everybody, to the, to the discussion today. Um, as Audrey mentioned, we have a, such a wonderful panel of uh, both industry and subject matter experts joining us today to talk about the, the subject that is, you know, Gen AI. We start the, the, the discussion today in just level setting um, where we're at today on the subject and what developments have occurred. March has been a major month in the subject of Gen AI. This has truly been an AI spring. Uh, with some of the largest players in the industry releasing flagship products and models uh, in the market. The financial services industry at large is both curious and keen to, to, to explore and implement and understand these, uh, these developments and understand how they will improve their, their operations, leading to unprecedented uh, sort of adoption and improvement in the, in the activity. In all this activity, um, leaders need to consider uh, the, uh, these, uh, these implications and these capabilities and how they apply within their organization, both to improve current processes and operations, as well as enabling newer ways of working in, uh, and newer products in the, in the market. Before we start on the discussion today uh, and, and learn more about this, We'd like to poll the group today and, and truly understand where, where you believe and where your understanding is on the subject of generative AI. The question on the poll today is what comes to mind when you think about applying generative AI in, in FSI? There's a, there's a link to Slido. You can um, point your camera at the QR code and that'll help you log in automatically. We'll stay here for a minute and get the group's reactions on, uh, on this question. Starting to see the first set of uh, responses coming on. So it's, a, it's definitely a buzzword. It's a game changer. See there's some, some fear in, in, in this new technology as well. Certainly uh, a, a, a key enabler for customer experience and for personalization, helping customer services, uh, better decision-making, see business value with a question mark. Risk management, that's a wonderful one as well. I shall 
let you decide how long we stay on this, but we're getting some wonderful feedback from the group so far. Agreed, all great feedback. I think we can move forward. Wonderful. Now these are these are all fair comments and the goal for today's session is for us together to unpack and, and learn more about some of these themes. Bef uh, before I hand over Anand to you to help us understand this a bit better, I just want to encourage the group to keep this an interactive session where you have questions for us, please type them in the chat and Aisha, myself and the, the, the core group here will try our best to bring those questions to the, the forum and to the panelists today. With that, Anand, I'm gonna um, you know, point the mic your way. Um, help us as a group understand what is the, the new development in, in generation, generative AI? What does it mean for us? Thanks, Shabazz. So generative AI, you know, if we really simplify what it is, it's a set of AI algorithms that can generate data from the data that they are trained on. So in the context here, you can see on this slide, the algorithms are trained by collecting large amounts of data. So um, they are typically neural networks, uh, deep learning models, uh, fed with the entire internet's worth of content. And uh, after that, from a user perspective, when you input a prompt, it will generate content. So that collected data could be text and images, and the content generated could be images, or it's text and text, uh, text in, text out. Or in other contexts, it's usually text as a input medium, and then multiple modalities. In some of the demos we've seen recently uh, with, with regard to multimodal, type models in this case, you can put in a prompt through text and have a robot actually execute an action. So for example, go and get me the rice chips from the drawer. So it's a, it's a space where the algorithms um, have some type of semantic understanding of our world and you interact with them by commanding them, by putting in a prompt or asking them to do something. And the output itself is net new, meaning it's it's potentially an amalgamation of everything that came prior, but, uh, but also uh, uh, net new in terms of it didn't exist anywhere else. Maybe let's go to the next slide. So what's required to actually run these things? And uh, the way these models are actually built within generative AI. So we'll start on the left here. There's a significant amount of specialized hardware that's required. So in some cases, uh, GPUs, so graphical processing units, which allow you to parallelize the, the computation required to train these models, but a significant number of very expensive GPUs. It's typically reserved for only the largest tech companies in terms of access, even large enterprise, even large banks, global banks, wouldn't necessarily need to make that type of investment. Um, the data itself, it's data from all over the internet. So imagine scraping the entire internet's worth of content and hosting that. Never mind the storage required, just the engineering challenge of doing that, you know, it's substantial. The models are quite simple in terms of their architecture, uh, meaning the research is widely published and um, the patterns that are employed are, are well known. Um, and the way these models are composed together may be composed through those prompts that we talked about earlier, and they may generate outputs, very, very types of outputs. On top, what we typically interface with is an application. So an application being like a, like a website or a mobile app or something that's actually allowing us to, to prompt the models and generate outputs. Some definitions on the right, uh, large language model, is you'll typically hear us say that LLM, what that refers to is a large neural network that's been trained to generate text outputs given an input text prompt. Um, or a text to image model, it's, Im it's text in, image text or images in, and images out. And then a multimodal model is what I spoke about earlier, which is it's trained to understand multiple mod modalities and then generate across those modalities. So text, image, audio, video, code, even robotics tasks, that's a multimodal context. Um, I'll hand it back to you, Shabazz. Thank you. Thank you for that definition, Anand. Certainly uh, a, a paradigm shift from the traditional 
uh, AI uh, that uh, that the group is that we as a group would have seen, heard, or used in our organizations. Uh, this next this next generation seems to have opened the the gates on both the complexity, volume, and variety of both inputs and outputs that it can it can handle and produce. Certainly, a lot to unpack for us as a group, and and perhaps that's where we'll start the conversation with uh, with our panelists today. The, the the first question that I have, and, and I'll point that to to the to the group, is how uh, in in our organizations, in your organizations today, are you thinking about uh, applying generative AI uh, in the business? Camille, maybe I'll start with you. Uh, how is Desjardins thinking about uh, generative AI? Um, so thank you for the question, Shabazz. And I really like this question, but I always tend to like not answer it fully um, <laughs> because I twist it around and think about why we want to use generative AI. Um, so for Desjardins, in 2017, our, our then new CEO officialized um, our organization's mission and it was that we wanted to grow individually and collectively to always do what was best for our members and clients so we realized in that context that shifting for our client relations centers from a very um, targeted on efficiency and productivity to more of a customer experience it would greatly impact our accessibility so we had to think and implement a roadmap that allowed both of these axes and transform our client relations centers. So we wanted to shave off um, irrelevant interaction and reuse these precious seconds uh, to benefit and elevate our customer service approach. So in this um, transformation, we were seeing from customers uh, through surveys and our MPS score, um, that it was way too complicated to navigate IVRs um, with traditional uh, button um, responses. So they had to press eight, press four, press 39,000, and they were not being directed to the right customer service representative. Um, so routing was also becoming increasingly complex for us. We have about 40 million yearly interactions at Desjardins in our call centers. Um, so we really wanted to provide autonomy, we wanted to allow clients to contact us on the channel of their choice and increase or maintain our accessibility and increase certainly customer experience. So with that in mind, um, it was really um, in, in towards these goals that we thought of the technology that was going to allow us to implement that. So it was natural language processing that we targeted and decided to implement um, in our IVRs. So currently we have one of the first virtual assistants that understands Canadian French. Um, it's available in two of our major IVRs. It, co it covers about 14 million yearly interactions already and also allows us um, to do four simple transactions in self-service. That's, that's wonderful to hear, Camille. And, and, and what I especially in, inspired is how you chose to prioritize the, the implementation of these modern technologies into sort of making the most impact against your mission. So, you know, better experience for your customers. It's wonderful. Heathcliff, maybe I'll uh, point to you uh, on RBC. Um, what does JN Gen AI mean to you at RBC? And what are you working on in, in these modern technologies? Absolutely. I, I think I was um, a part of this journey um, way back from 2017 when I joined this, um, when I joined RBC, uh, AI was just coming online um, in the mainstream. Uh, one of the things that we were doing at that time were lots of POCs and there was a, there was a understanding of the potential of this technology. And uh, Borealis AI, which is um, a very big uh, part of our identity in the space, was, um, was punching above its weight. It had created an open ecosystem of researchers um, from academia, as well as from uh, uh, organizations coming together to democratize how AI can be potentially used across uh, banking, but just not limited to banking. So one, one of the journeys that uh, we went on was uh, identifying the potential uses of this technology. And when I fast forward to 2022, um, we had established a team called the RBC Brain. 
we were trying to take all that research and apply it at scale across the bank. And that, that's when um, ChatGPT came out. And honestly, it, it was um, a step change uh, in terms of the uh, momentum that uh, we started seeing in the organization. Um, NLP has been around, large language models have been around, but honestly, this was the catalyst or that moment where things started to get a lot more attention inside the organization. And we're really just scratching the surface. I liked your iceberg uh, picture that you said, right? Like we are looking at the tip of the iceberg today with these technologies. I don't know um, how, how, uh, how we are going to implement um, um, all of these uh, potential applications of this technology. But what I can say is that RDC has invested heavily in the talent, in the leadership, and, um, and is going to recognize those investments through the uh, step change that uh, this technology is presenting to us. So if this had come out in 2017, we might have been hard pressed to make use of it. But today we are, I think, well positioned to apply this technology at scale inside the bank. That's a wonderful story, Heathcliff. And I think what inspires me about RBC's journey is how you um, rally around sort of a, a core center of excellence and looking at innovative technology like you know, AI and conversational AI. And, and use that center of excellence to catalyze the change within the organization as well. That's a, that's a wonderful strategy that seems to be paying you dividends at, the, at, at RBC. Yep, time will tell. Wonderful. Um, I'll shift now to our, uh, our, our, our platform and our technology uh, panelists, Priyanka. From, from, from where you sit at Google and where you uh, engage with clients and, and leaders in this space, what what direction do you see uh, you know AI and generative AI take in financial services? What are you seeing across the corner that uh, that that we need to get that we should be getting excited about? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. Because um, I think I want to like to Anand's point earlier. Um, we have we have seen this emerge over uh, with natural language processing over the last like five-ish years or so evolve a little further. Um, so I would like to point to, um, we started off with a ton of research on the Google side. Um, in 2017 is when we came out with this paper on transformers, which was the breakthrough that led to um, things like GPT and, um, and all the others to follow. Um, and over those years, we've come out with, with research along these areas. There's BERT, if you've heard of that, which is a bi-directional encoder, um, and then text-to-text -text transformers, which Anand touched on a little bit as well, then research on Lambda, which is more of a dialogue model to have conversations. We launched that in 2020. Um, and then most recently in the past month or so, We've been um, we've been working on creating um, a large language um, model since the, the the 2017 research of the transformers, um, and we called it Pathways Language Model or Palm, uh, which we announced last week. Um, and that is a 540 billion parameter model, which uh, what that means is basically it's a really large model with a large number of large amount of data, large corpus of data and parameters are, are really just an indicator of understanding from, from normal language, general language perspective. Uh, that how big this model is. Um, so we are we are on this journey of doing a lot more research and making some of these uh, these uh, models possible with the infrastructure and the um, and Anand mentioned some uh, about the types of infrastructure that 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 is required to build these models. So Google is um, a, we are basically investing in what would be those, those processing units that would be required. And there's been a ton of research we've done over the last five, 10 years on, on that as well. And, we, um, and if you're following that research, we have built our own tensor processing units. These are parallel processors to, to actually uh, train these models in parallel and at, at a faster speed than any other processors. Uh, we came out with uh, TPU version five 
recently as well. This is also the, this is on the infrastructure side of, of research and, and development. Um, I've talked a little bit about the, the uh, machine learning research and development and the infrastructure. Where I'm excited about this going is, is the application and of these models to be available to the users. So with the with the creation of the Palm model, because we recognize that not every company will have the resources to build these large models. What they would ha have resources for is the expertise to build on top of that and uh, and create in in this in today's conversation, for example, we're talking about uh, the applicability of these models in financial services and and how they are going to be uh, taken advantage of. So in our cloud products in Vertex AI, um, we also launched the access of these models as APIs. So uh, anybody. Um, in, in retail or infrastructure can basically use these models, use the Palm model as the background um, and build with additional data of, of, let's say financial services, you can build a customized model that applies to RBC or to other bank and um, and then you can apply that into your applications to create, um, create to generate content, create campaigns, things like that. Um, and that's what excites me a lot more because it seems like we are, and this is still just the beginning of the infrastructure enhancements and creation of these large language models, but it's also the beginning of the consumption of these models and applying them into, into real world scenarios like this, which is, which is very, very exciting. And we're making that possible with customers today. Wonderful, Priyanka. Certainly a, a story around enabling uh, organizations of all sizes and all maturities uh, to get on and experiment and certainly apply Gen AI in, in, in their operations. We'll, we'll switch gears uh, sensitive of time and, 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 and really talk about, um, you know, what are some of, the, some of the use cases, what are some of the applications that we are, we're seeing, um, you know, Gen AI enable or apply today. Um, maybe just uh, Heathcliff, starting with you on this question, um, when, can you, can you talk a bit about some of the, the use cases that RBC has developed? Um, with Gen AI, with some of the, these technologies, and how that's uh, rolling out in the, in the bank. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, so as I said, we are just scratching the surface using generative AI because it's uh, it's it's not new, but uh, it is a step change that uh, has come to our shores, and we have to react. Mm. So with that in mind, uh, we not put uh, I would say anything yet um, fully into production. That being said, our focus has been on operations and efficiency. Uh, with that in mind, one of the areas that comes up oftentimes is how do we manage unstructured data that shows up every day uh, in very high volumes? So emails uh, are a classic uh, uh, use case which comes to mind where mm -hmm. there have been uh, attempts in the past through robotic process automation and others to identify efficiencies to make that process simpler so that you don't have a lot of humans pouring over those uh, emails and, and spending time to classify them manually and to put them into queues so that they can go to the next part of the workflow. Uh, with generative AI technologies, there is an opportunity to accelerate that investment. So if you take what process automation has already occurred in the space, if you look at um, email content, uh, we have the ability using um, uh, language models, which is uh, which is a two part, um, uh, which is two parts essentially. It's got the encoder and the decoder. Uh, lots of the generative AI part uh, essentially talks about uh, language being generated, but what's underlies it is that large language model that can actually decode uh, language itself and allows you to extract information that is very very important for you to do processing either upstream or downstream. So if you look at that email corpus, um, what large language models will allow us to do very well in the near future is how do we recognize what's coming in as an email? How can we auto classify it? 
how can we put them in the right context of the question being asked and now with generative ai uh, becoming multimodal it can look at attachments it can look at images it can look at audio and it can start to generate a, a decent response back uh, so you've seen some of this already in action with microsoft and google in our uh, in our in our retail context but um, we can see that happening uh, in a more um, established way inside the larger organizations such as ours where we can then take a summary of the entire email generate a response let a human in the loop look at it and then uh, respond back appropriately to the user at no point i'm suggesting that uh, an ai can uh, do all of it from end to end uh, because there is significant challenges uh, you know with this technology that have to still be overcome but the promise is real there is an opportunity we've invested in uh, in 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 this technology for email automation and we're seeing a, a good return we're seeing um, uh, right now we the industry benchmark is um, uh, is about 35% in terms of automations but uh, we are we are getting close to 25% uh, improvements you know to auto classify emails to pick the right responses that we can give back to the customer and i'm talking about domains that were traditionally uh, pretty um, uh, human uh, oriented or focused or dominated uh, things such as legal right where there is a lot more emphasis on the language that um, is is expressed because it can have a cost associated with it if you choose the wrong responses to send back so with with that promise in mind i think generative ai has a lot of potential to automate emails and to improve workflows and to help uh, organizations as large as ours who have multiple mailboxes to see some efficiencies Thank you for that, Heathcliff. Certainly, a, a very inspiring uh, sort of story narrative around uh, you know how you're looking to prioritize Gen AI in the organization. Um, Anand, maybe for you, uh, since we're uh, we're discussing sort of Gen AI use cases, where do you see some of our clients and some of the some of the FSI leaders uh, apply Gen AI in their programs? So, I think in the very short term. A lot of uh, a lot of our client leaders are looking at implementing generative AI in the contact center. So essentially, where there is an existing business case, where where they have already considered conversational AI technology, um, and where uh, you know to to reduce the development effort to get to to market faster with a solution, mm -hmm. and to be uh, more conversational in terms of its ability to understand and respond. Right. Um, there's a pattern around deploying it there. And so we can kind of consider that under the uh, pillar here of productivity and augmentation, right? Because we're essentially, uh, when it's a customer facing context, uh, it's, it's reducing the, the work of agents, like human agents, uh, because it's able to handle those interactions entirely autonomously. And in the, in the uh, employee facing context, it actually augments the agent, you know, potentially helping them generate or create responses. Um, or it can retrieve knowledge uh, that's relevant to the conversation. So it listens as the call happens and it retrieves knowledge. In other cases, uh, kind of separate of call center, we're looking at uh, interactions like um, in the marketing creative uh, sense, right? So essentially speeding up copywriting, speeding up advertising, improving product design, branding, um, even in the case of financial services, generating advice. Um, and and in, in any case uh, where this is being used, um, you know, when it's customer facing, you want to reduce the risks. I think there was a question around hallucination in the, in the chat. You want to manage that through different techniques. Um, and over time, the research will catch up to actually reduce that entirely uh, or to a manageable level. But um, for most other deployments of generative AI, consider them assistive technologies at this time, just due to the risks around um, the augmentation and um, the, sorry, the risk around generation in an ungrounded way. So essentially, potentially exposing your organization to uh, mm -hmm. um, mistruths. Thank you for that. Um, Anand, while I have you, uh, while you have on the mic, uh, there's a question from the, from the participants that I'd like your response on. Uh, it's a technical question around a sp specific thresholds for the parameters of large language models. We previously uh, heard um, BART having 530 billion uh, parameters and GPT-4, for example, is allegedly 100 trillion. 
does it have any major implications on the text generation task, the number of parameters? So typically with kind of the existing architectures, right, with uh, additional parameters that, that get loaded into the model, uh, uh, essentially they're akin to synapses in a brain, right? So the more synapses that they have, um, the, the more intelligent that they're going to be. So they're going to, you know, require less prescriptive prompting. Um, they're going to generate things that are better informed. They'll be able to stay on task better. Um, but that doesn't mean that the smaller models, um, one, are, are underperforming because there's a lot of different architectures being uh, implemented, right? So GPT is actually, it's a pretty old uh, architecture, meaning, you know, it's three to four years old. Uh, from GPT-1 to GPT-2, there was a, essentially a very small shift. And then from GPT-2 to 3, a similar shift. So just training with more and more data and uh, increasing the parameter count. But uh, firms like Google are actually looking at uh, alternative patterns and architectures completely different. Um, you know, Meta released uh, the, the Llama architecture and then Stanford just released something called Alpaca. Um, the goal there is actually to reduce the parameter count to something completely manageable, something that we can actually train on commodity hardware that we, we all have access to um, and, um, and still achieve the same performance. So you're kind of seeing these competing forces, right? So on the research and uh, um, the development side for, for some of these larger tech companies, it's increasing the, increasing the size of the models. That means feeding it with more data and having larger representations of you know, semantic understanding. Um, I would say that I would caution everyone here, like as you deploy these models, think about the lock-in that you're going to have to manage, right? So like the models, they, depending on the, the way it generates outputs and the data it's trained on and uh, the size and parameters at that point in time, you know, you may have to essentially prompt the models in specific sequences to generate an outcome that you're looking for. Um, over time, you know, making an investment around one particular platform will lock you into that model, even as those models improve in, in performance, uh, you know, there's a potentially a large lift to manage, right? So there has to be a better way around, um, around deployment and uh, making it more vendor agnostic, I think over time. And so I think where we should be investing is more around looking at functional task completion. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of understanding or, or, or measuring performance on specific benchmarks, uh, you know, Stanford uh, publishes this benchmark called Helm, H-E-L-M, uh, you know, I encourage everyone to go take a look. There's a lot of benchmarks between models out there, and they can essentially uh, benchmark models on Q&A uh, tasks or toxicity detection, things like very specific tasks. Um, but, th you know, th this is all uh, not really relevant in a business context. In a business context, you'd want to make sure that the particular outcome you're trying to achieve is, is being achieved. And um, where possible, I would try to select the, a model that can actually run uh, on hardware you control versus... Um, uh, essentially having to send your data over to a large vendor. Wonderful. I have a, I have a very related question that I'd, uh, Priyanka, maybe like uh, your reaction on. The question from um, Christian here is, in the near to medium future, how reasonable is it to expect that small and medium businesses can use their own data in the AI models? Uh, or alternatively, are we going to see more in the way of SaaS solutions that small medium businesses will need to rely on uh, for Gen AI? Very good question. Um, and, and here's my recommendation. I'll throw that with this question here as well. Um, these models are require a ton of research, a ton of resources, and a ton of machine learning expertise to actually build and develop. In the near term, what we're going to see happen um, is, is the use of, of very specific use cases being applied into, into, the, into the businesses. And uh, by that, I mean, um, at Google, we've got about four solutions in the category that are very specific to, so we've, we've abstracted on, they're built on top of Palm, on, of Palm uh, model, um, but we have a conversational um, AI in, uh, service that sort of takes all of these and wraps it up into a conversational AI um, offering. Um, and businesses can just, if they're looking to improve customer experience, they can just utilize that for agent productivity as well as, uh, as, well as utilizing um, a chatbot type experience or a voice bot experience in phone calls. 
um, for other use cases like the ones uh, where where you're doing OCR on uh, or optical character recognition on documents and PDF and images, um, and then take in and then creating a, a tabular or um, basically converting your your uh, your documents into uh, into an understandable format, a machine understandable format, so you can utilize that into other applications. That is that service we already have abstracted as an API uh, called Document AI, Document AI API. So you can utilize that. So I see I see in near term. Um, the application of these things. We have the same in healthcare where you can send images and, uh, and the diagnostics uh, based, on, based on those come as part of the API. So these would be some of the, uh, some of the real world near term applications that uh, small to medium uh, businesses, companies would be uh, and should be looking at. Um, and, and that's that's kind of where you start. And then um, two, I, I would like to extrapolate a little bit from Anand's point here as well, is you you are using the underlying model, but the data that you uh, that you that the your company specific data sets that you bring in make that model richer and 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 allows you to provide more experiences that are specific to your business, and um, and that's exactly where Google's investing. So that if you use Vertex AI, the the launches that we did in the last um, week or so are all focused on how do we help customize these models for a very specific business use case that you might have. And, um, and then the custom model can be deployed in the hardwares of your choice, um, which is also why uh, us putting in the research into trying to make these models as small as possible, as manageable as possible, and still being able to provide the, the utility out, out of them. Um, and th those are critical pieces because we can't have these really big models uh, being deployed as, as spe for specific use cases. It's just not going to scale and be mass consumed if that is the case. So um, with that, um, I, I hope that answers the question, but foreseeable future is where you would bring the data and have smaller models built on top of some of these, these bigger model research. Thank you for that, Priyanka. Um, We'll, we'll shift the, the narrative and now sort of there's a, there's a couple of questions in the chat that are related to this theme. So I think it's worthwhile we, we talk about this. We, we've certainly explored the art of the possible. We've talked about some very real impact that Gen AI is making in, in, in your organizations and with your clients. Um, but I'd also like to explore what are some of the considerations, um, gotchas, and then perhaps even limitations that we need to be as a group aware of. Camille, maybe I'll start with you on this first. Uh, from your perspective, what are some of the considerations that you see uh, we need to be aware of with, uh, with applying Gen AI in our organizations? Uh, what are you thinking about? Um, that's a great question. I think that the first part of my answer is really going to be geared towards like the implication, like what it means to um, implement Gen AI um, for the humans that are um, working with us. Um, so for us, as I said uh, previously in my answer, the goal for Desjardins has always been to reuse the precious seconds that were made available through our NLP um, implementation to make sure that we had a better understanding of our caller's need and that we leverage the information that was already exchanged with our virtual assistant for our customer service representatives. Um, so we are absolutely seeing the virtual assistant as a new agent in, our, in this case, and not as one that is replacing our human ones. And that was one of the, um, um, the fears that was um, really going around um, when we started talking about implementing an NLP of voice bot. So um, seeing that virtual assistant as a new agent, um, it does come and complement our human workforce. It's one that also takes simple steps to improve their ability to answer and cater to our members and clients needs and requests. 
And not only we are seeing that we're improving call routing, customer experience and containing certain calls that we do not have to take anymore in our call centers. We're also using it to provide insight to the nature of the calls. Um, so we're really bridging the experience between the virtual agent and the human agent so that this fear of I'm going to be replaced or my job is not relevant anymore is really not the target. Um, I, I do tend to think of um, in a no limit ideation, we really want to improve our customer service representatives knowledge and simplify their ecosystem. So that what we see is not only the performance aspect of Gen AI, but also um, as an advisor for the human agents so that we can improve the quality and, um, and the quantity of meaningful interactions uh, by creating relevant content that would not be possible without this AI. Absolutely, appreciate the feedback. Well, certainly augmentation is sort of a big theme. Heathcliff, I wonder if you have sort of similar uh, considerations or are there other uh, sort of are there other sort of themes that you've explored uh, as you roll out, you know, perhaps your email automation platform or other pilots uh, at RBC? Absolutely. I think uh, one of the things that the bank um, operates on is trust. Um, mm -hmm. It's a currency that's been established over over 150 years. Uh, one of the key to adoption of this technology is the ability to trust it. And we have an entire um, vertical inside the brain team that is looking at this technology to identify um, areas where uh, it can be trusted. Um, because simply if we don't do it, uh, our customers can, will do it. And then there is an issue with that. So to, 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 to just give an example of what I mean by this is, um, in that email automation example, uh, one of the things that is obvious, um, but sometimes can get uh, neglected is when am I talking to an AI and when am I talking to a human being, right? Just having that established and made clear to our end customer is very, very key to uh, having them uh, understand that currently they're talking to an AI and they're having responses generated through an AI and they will be handed off to an agent. I think Camille mentioned it. They have virtual assistants working very closely with human advisors. So we need to we need to define those boundaries for our customers. And it's it's absolutely important because it's an ethical choice that we need to make, um, as well as um, try to understand the technology uh, and its limitations. So currently, uh, the the large language models, in my opinion. Uh, its objective is to identify the token that it's going to generate next. And it looks at an entire corpus and it kind of uh, is, is predicting the tokens that it should be using and putting those tokens together to create a, a meaningful looking sentence. But that meaningful looking sentence in that email might not be completely factual. So how do I augment it to give it the fact base that it requires using my data inside the bank? And that's where the, um, the question comes into the picture is, do we give our data to uh, the language model or do we uh, fine tune the language model on our data? Um, and what are the risks associated with it? So these are all unanswered questions at this point. There are lots of different approaches that have been proposed, but we need to look into those approaches because simply giving our data to the language model and asking it to come back with an answer, it might look like the perfect answer. But and it is perfect from an English standpoint, but it may not be factual from a banking standpoint. So that's where we need to be. We, we are looking at ways to augment these models. Um, and I think um, Google may have. Um, uh, I think Priyanka, you might have mentioned this uh, with Langchain and things such as that. Like we give the model the ability to be focused on what it does really well. I think somebody in the somebody in the audience asked this question. Like, can your model detect sarcasm? I think the large language models are good at detecting sarcasm. I've been talking to them and they're kind of good at detecting sarcasm, but are they good at identifying uh, a balance in somebody's uh, account? Maybe not. So that's something that is specialized and uh, easily available inside the bank. It's, it's about chaining these things together so that you get a better response 
out to the customer and you satisfy the customer need versus uh, giving them an answer really fast, which might not be factual. So that's just my take on some of the considerations to keep in mind. Certainly a, a lot to think through Heathcliff. And I just mindful of time and certainly a lot of the interest from the, from the audience as well. Uh, perhaps time for us to switch to sort of direct Q&A and uh, again, encourage the participants and encourage all attendees. If you have direct questions for the panelists, please uh, put them in the chat. We'll do our best to, to flag them. Um, Anand, maybe I'll ask a question, uh, a question directly to you. Um, how do you foresee uh, businesses maintaining their competitive edge with you know, an abundance of free information and education online, open source, Gen AI development, smaller models with des you know, less hardware and, and data requirements? How should businesses think about this? So there's actually, um, I'll, I'll kind of give an analogy. So, when the, you know, when the f car first came out, um, uh, I think a lot, you know, like we don't, want, we don't typically build cars in our backyard anymore, right? But when, when the car first came out, there was a lot of that, right? Um, and then eventually the factory uh, was released, right? And then cars were just coming off of a factory. And uh, then you stop thinking about building cars. You just thought about what you do with them, right? Like maybe I'll start a shipping company or, you, you know what I mean? Like there's some... Uh, some usage of the output of that factory. If you think about these large models um, as an AI platform um, and uh, as an AI factory, right? Uh, how do you kind of compose them? Uh, so the resulting AI that comes out of it, how do you apply it to your use case? And I think uh, in those cases, you, you want to leverage the data you have, right? Because the models are trained on the internet and, you know, some of them have, I think, very, they have good understanding of, very specialized domains. Like I think GPT-4, when they announced the blog, it had a 90 percentile score on the unified uh, bar exam. So very uh, good understanding of legal, uh, you know, le legal terminology and, and, and uh, that domain. Um, but wherever you have private data that's not available on the internet is an opportunity for you, right? So that data, when, when leveraging a model that can understand natural language and has it's able to understand kind of semantic semantically concepts within our world right to to in the task of generating uh, that, that's how it works it needs to build up a conceptual understanding of our world so if you can um add your data as a layer on top and then compose maybe multiple models together into an application suddenly you are you're building something net new a product that actually relies on this technology but you know, saves you a bunch of time. It is, these are applications that could not have existed before this technology, uh, you know, came into being. And if you look at like how Microsoft announced Copilot, um, it's kind of that, right? Like the large language model is one component, but then there are the Microsoft ecosystem of applications. There's the Microsoft knowledge graph, which is essentially an event feed of all interactions that you, you, um, uh, you partake in with your applications. When you combine those data sets and that knowledge, um, with the large language model, then you come up with a new product that is um, uh, highly beneficial, right? So that's how you build competitive advantage. Thank you for that, Anand. That was a very comprehensive answer. Um, I think we have time for one final question before we shift gears. Um, Priyanka, yeah, just me, I'll talk at this to you. Uh, briefly, what do you think are some of the limits of Gen AI today? How do you see them evolving in the next few years? Yeah, um, I think one of the biggest ones that we're starting to see is this term hallucination, um, where the models can generate, um, if it doesn't know, it can, it can with confidence tell you things that may not be true. And that is what is defined as, as hallucination in terms of LLMs. Um, and that is scary, right? Because you could, you could get any and all kinds of things, and you would, um, as humans, um, want to trust whatever is coming out of it, right? And uh, that is that is the part, especially when it comes to business use cases, um, you have to be very careful. So the way I see some of this evolve is um, there's going to be developments in the way we train these models to uh, to limit the the amount of hallucination. Um, but on the business side, the way uh, I think in near term, we would uh, think at 
at applying these la large language models is um, is it in combination with uh, with some APIs. So what I mean by that is um, I think <clears throat> um, Heathcliff sort of touched on this a tiny bit where we uh, where we have to be very careful that um, there is this large language model that you're using to, let's say, do customer service. But then you have to have some API layer in the middle where this API layer is talking to um, to or do or building some sort of logic where you say, if I hear words like this, this and that, or um, a user is asking for um, balanced information, don't use the LLM, go to this API instead, get the information. So there's, be, there's going to be this combination of using the large language models for what they are good at doing today, yep. which is uh, natural language, being able to understand the context of the question, being able to go a little bit back in the context of the conversation, and then, um, and then trying to find the best answer possible with the corpus that you've trained it on. But then having a middle layer is sort of what is going to be important for any business uh, business implementations of these LLMs. Um, these are also problems we are tackling from the research side, but mm -hmm. I think in the near term, that is where, where the applications need to be. Fantastic. Thank you, Priyanka, for your answer. And, and thank you, Camille. Anand, Shabazz, Heathcliff for being with us today. Really appreciate you, appreciate you uh, helping us demystify Gen AI as applied to FSI. Um, to continue the conversation, uh, we by no means intend to have solved all of your problems and we can see through the list of questions, this, this uh, deserves longer conversation. Um, so we'd love to encourage you to tap on, on our shoulder and think about uh, uh, joining one of our AI labs, Gen AI labs dedicated to your organization. If this is of interest to you in the coming weeks, uh, do reach out to our AI Institute or Anand, Anand Nimkar on this webcast. We would love to um, help you work through, through the, the opportunity that Gen AI provides. We polled you uh, at the start of the webcast on what comes to mind when you think about generative AI as applied to FSI. We're really curious um, to poll you again and see what is on your mind right now. So we'd love to run that poll quickly now uh, before we let you go and see um, if we've been able to shift your thinking in any way or if some of the words are still coming up the same. So let's do this again and see when you're thinking about applying generative AI to your organization, your FSI organization, what comes to mind? Can we, Atif, can we clear the responses and allow people to do this again? Fantastic, thank you for that. All right, give us 30 seconds. We are just uh, having an issue with our polling, so I'm gonna see if we can uh, relaunch that. All right. On the first uh, first slide, we saw some Terminator still. So hopefully um, that has uh, turned into a bit more narrow. Okay, someone is confused. Um, not good. Well, we need to make sure that we, uh, we handle that one. Um, security, not ready for prime time. Yeah, so it needs refinement, right? You can't necessarily launch it into your client-facing applications overnight. Some privacy security uh, considerations and security considerations. Yeah. And the ROI. So is that is that ROI use case uh, clear? So definitely uh, some considerations, right? And I think back to the, the discussions around the lab, those are things that uh, need to be handled use case by use case. Uh, so very important to think about that use case dimension and the importance of human in the loop. Absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, would love to um, also uh, get your feedback on the overall session and uh, invite you to join some of our future sessions. Um, in March, we'll be celebrating and recognizing uh, women pioneer in machine learning and AI. So on March 30th, please do join us to hear from uh, women pioneers in this field. Um, Atif, if we can show the, the other events, uh, we have 
<laughs> a few other events for, for you lined up on the topic of Gen AI, but also uh, related topics. So for example, in April, we'll be talking about data monetization, uh, unlocking uh, Web3 uh, Web or Metaverse in May. So don't hesitate to sign up for our future events. Uh, it's my pleasure to thank you all again for joining us today, uh, our esteemed panelists and audience members. Thanks for your trust and confidence and looking forward to continue the conversation on Gen AI with you. If you have a few more seconds, do let us know how we did. Um, give us feedback so we can strengthen these sessions in the coming weeks. And to the Deloitte AI Institute team, a big thank you for uh, the agility and the flexibility. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon.